First he was poisoned, now they have locked him away in a supermax prison. Opposition leader Alexei Navalny today sentenced to 10 more years, on top of the nine he is already serving. France calls it judicial persecution. We'll bring you reaction tonight from the director of the Navalny documentary. Also tonight, the world's oceans hit their warmest ever recorded temperature. And Ukraine says it's carried out a sea drone attack on a Russian Navy ship in the Black Sea. But it's not all going Ukraine's way. We'll talk tonight about the Russian jamming equipment that is slowing the counteroffensive. Good evening. Alexei Navalny knew what dangers he was facing when he returned to Russia in 2021. In the previous months, before he went back, he'd been recovering in Germany from Novichok poisoning. To many, it looked like a failed attempt by Russian intelligence to silence him once and for all. He's been a constant thorn in President Putin's side. Mr. Navalny's YouTube channel repeatedly exposed the Kremlin's corruption. It now has over 30 million followers, and so despised is he by the leadership in Moscow that Mr. Putin never re refers to him by name. So it was an extremely brave thing to go back, but how he is paying for it. Alexei Navalny was already serving nine years in a high security prison for alleged fraud, a parole violation and contempt of court. Today, a judge added another 10 for alleged links to extremism, which his supporters say were entirely fabricated. Our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, was in court as Mr. Navalny was sentenced. He sent this report. This is the closest we were allowed to get to Russia's most famous prisoner. We'd been let inside the high security jail where Alexei Navalny is already incarcerated. But journalists weren't allowed into the makeshift courtroom. We had to watch on a screen. For the Kremlin critic, this is a trial behind bars. He was found guilty on extremism charges and handed a 19-year prison sentence. We may have been allowed in here to watch the verdict on a TV screen. But keep in mind that in this court case, the actual proceedings were closed to the press and to the public and held in a high-security prison Describing this trial as behind closed doors feels like an understatement. Ahead of the verdict, in a message online, Mr. Navalny wrote that a long prison sentence for him was designed to scare Russians. He revealed he'd soon be on trial again for terrorism. A charismatic protest leader and anti-corruption crusader, Alexei Navalny fell foul of the Kremlin long ago. In 2020, in Siberia, he was poisoned with a nerve agent and airlifted to Germany. He claims the Kremlin had tried to kill him. The Russian authorities denied. On his return to Russia in 2021, he was arrested and jailed. Ever since, he's faced trial after trial, punishment after punishment. It indicates that this regime is ready to be extremely cruel. It sends messages to uh, the broader audience. We will not stop. The machine is working. And uh, it means uh, that they are ready uh, to uh, continue all possible trials against all possible dissidents. That includes this man. Igor Girkin is no pro-democracy liberal. The Russian nationalist backs the war in Ukraine but has criticized Vladimir Putin's handling of it. Now he's under arrest, as the Kremlin tries to crack down on any kind of criticism. Back at the Navalny trial, once the verdict was delivered, we were ushered off the penal colony premises. But after today's conviction, and with possibly more charges against him to follow, Alexei Navalny looks set to remain locked away for years to come. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News in the town of Melikhova, Russia. Well, since Steve filed that report, we have had word from Alexei Navalny in a post on X, the app formerly known as Twitter, told his almost 3 million followers, 19 years in a maximum security penal colony, the number of years does not matter. I perfectly understand that like many political prisoners, I am sitting on a life sentence where life is measured by the term of my life or the term of life of this regime. The sentencing figure is not for me, it is for you. 
you, not me, are being frightened and deprived of the will to resist. You are being forced to surrender your country of Russia without a fight to the gang of traitors, thieves and scoundrels who have seized power. Putin does not achieve his goal. Do not lose the will to resist. With us tonight, Daniel Roja, the director of Navalny, the 2022 Oscar-winning documentary about the opposition leader's poisoning, and Arik Tola, journalist from the investigative group Bellingcat. Welcome to you both. Um, Daniel, let me start with you. He's right in what he says in that tweet. Yes, he is the one facing 19 years in a maximum security prison, a sentence he might not survive, but it is there, that sentence, to scare and intimidate anyone who follows him. Well, that's just right. This regime has been consistent. What they want to do is squash dissent and do it at any means necessary. It's as if since the invasion of uh, Ukraine and, and the ramp up of this war, they have done everything they can to completely, completely destroy anyone who has any morsel of uh, dissent in Russia. And Navalny and many of his colleagues are paying the price for that. I watched the documentary again last night, and the, the bit that is very hard to watch is the moment he leaves um, Germany with his wife, Julia, and, and they fly back to Moscow. And he knows, and he stares out of the window, and he knows exactly what he's going back to. When you consider what has happened today, would his purpose not have been better served lobbying and writing and campaigning as a dissident outside Russia? Well, obviously, that's a very challenging question, but it's one that I, like many people, have asked myself many times. At the end of the day, Navalny's decision to go back was a decision he made between himself, his family, and his higher power. More than anything, what Vladimir Putin, what Vladimir Putin wanted was to get rid of Navalny. If not murder him, then have him be thrusted into exile. And I think for Navalny, staying away was giving the Kremlin too great a gift. He wanted to go back, and he wanted to be the moral leader of the nation. Um, some people call that savior complex. Some people think that he would be better served outside the country. But whether you can criticize the decision or not, you can't help but find his courage admirable. Oh, indeed. Um, Eric, why do you why do you think the, the Kremlin invited foreign journalists into the prison today? Well, I mean, of course, it gives it kind of an air of legitimacy, right? Because they this. You know, everyone knows this is a basically a show trial. It's not too terribly different than you know foreign correspondents being present at the um, the prison hearings during Stalin's time, right in the in 36, 37. And it kind of gives it you know it, almost as if it's not a complete farce. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know exactly what the reasoning was for it, but I mean it, you know if it, it would be a little bit too obvious, maybe it's obvious enough if, if they barred foreign journalists. But I think it, it I would just look to the parallels of the show trials from the uh, from Stalin's times, if you want to look to, when they also had foreign journalists present there as well, too. Since we're talking about extremism, <laughs> all right, can we go back to August 2020, um, when Alexei was poisoned with a Novichok uh, uh, nerve agent? Because Bellingcat did so much work uh, uh, with Daniel watching on, on on what happened on that trip to Siberia. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the work that you've done since, that the group's done since, in enables you to say that this was without doubt a poisoning carried out by the state ordered by Vladimir Putin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, we don't know exactly who ordered it. We have to assume it was Putin at this point because it was you know, someone who was as, as high profile as Navalny. You can't imagine this being done by you know, some random underling who's assigning this operation because as we know, as you saw from the documentary in our investigation that fed into the documentary, uh, the team that trailed Navalny and poisoned him, it wasn't just one random rogue guy, it was a full team. It was, you know, a dozen people who were uh, providing support. They had the Soviet-era chemical weapon of Novichok and scientists working with it. So it was a gigantic project. It wasn't just one rogue guy who poisoned his underwear. It was a whole team of people who, who, who did it. Um, and it's hard to imagine this not being approved from, from the very top. But Daniel, in the documentary, um, it is one guy who lifts the lid on what happened unwittingly. It's this chemist called Kurya Kuryavstev. Uh, he's from this institute in Moscow that produced the Novichok. And very soon after this video that you produced airs, this documentary, he, he goes missing. He dis he, he's disappeared. Has he ever been found? 
Well, I think Eric might be able to uh, speak to this with greater clarity, but my understanding is that Christo, Christo Grozet, the journalist whose work fuels the investigation within our documentary, um, found Kudratsev in a COVID database somewhere in Siberia about 18 months after uh, uh, the, the events on the, in the phone call that are depicted in the movie took place. My understanding is that he's still alive, but he's probably relegated to some horrible desk job that nobody wants in the outer regions. So that, would that suggest, Eric, that, that there has been a clean-up operation to hide the evidence of, of what they've done to Alexei Navalny? To a degree. I mean, this is something that Christo has uncovered with a lot of the operatives from um, the poisonings, not just in Navalny, but also of Sergei Skripal and Salisbury uh, back a few years ago. And many of the people who were involved in this poisoning, some of them were reassigned, you know, sometimes to um, not so great gigs, right, off in Siberia, like we have with Kudratsev. But also sometimes, you know, they moved to the presidential administration. And just um, a few weeks ago, um, General Avernayev, um, um, who was um, in charge of the operation to poison so, um um, Skripal, Sergei Skripal, and um, accidentally his daughter in Salisbury, he showed up in this meeting in the African summit in St. Petersburg of African leaders there. He was kind of gave a little gave a little speech and he was introduced there. So it's not like they're all being, you know, sent off to the gulag in disgrace. Um, a lot of them are being, you know, even promoted um, for their for their work. So it's not, you know, this isn't necessarily a shameful thing for the Russian security services. Maybe shameful that it failed and, the, you know, the underlings and the grunts in the bottom, maybe you're getting reassigned. But the guys on top, you know, they're not really suffering any serious consequences. Daniel, the documentary that you produce starts with Alexei staring into the camera and you ask him a question. If you're killed, what message would you leave behind for the Russian people? And he reacts to this, this as, though, as though he doesn't think in the moment that, that death is the outcome. But I just wonder if he might answer that question differently today. Well, you know, yours is a good question, but again, it's one that we would have to pose to Alexei himself. I'm not in a position to speak for him. I would say I can't help but imagine that he would not have um, reconsidered his options had the war been launched when he decided to go back. It was about a year after he went back that the war was launched. Um, I, I'm sure that would have changed the calculus, but also I don't know that for sure, because at the end of the day, um, Navalny was deep, is deeply committed to his country. He's very patriotic. He did not feel comfortable staying in exile. Um, and it, it just goes to show what one man is willing to sacrifice for his beliefs and the future of his nation. And, um, you know, uh, his courage is stunning and uh, it's, it's a real tragedy um, that we're not going to get to see him for a long time. He's been, Eric, in, in a, a, a hunger strike, uh, which he's come out of and he survived. He did look, um, he didn't look great today, um, a shadow of the man that left Germany. Do you ever wonder and consider why they keep him alive? It's hard to say. I mean, they have, you know, a long history of keeping political prisoners around for quite a while. I mean, it could be a future chip to play, right? So you kind of think about future high profile sw prisoner swaps and or maybe, you know, efforts of goodwill. You know, Hunter Kolsky, for example, he was in prison for quite a long time and he was released around, if I recall correctly, around the Sochi Olympics as kind of an act of you know, goodwill towards the West, right? So he, you know, he he's not really doing any the terrible amount of harm, I suppose, in prison. I mean, he he, you know, he has his Twitter account and he has FBK, but um, the you know his organization has been labeled extremist. Its members have scattered throughout Europe and the Baltics and the Caucasus largely, and they're not really a threat to the regime right now. So as long as they keep him up in prison, he could be useful down the road for you know high profile you know prisoner swap or kind of you know after the war years down the line, you know maybe he's he released as kind of an effort of as a token of, you know, of a thaw, you know, kind of thinking in, into the future. Um, and you can't really do that if he's dead, I suppose. So if I'm just kind of thinking, you know, years in advance, maybe that's, you know, he's a future chip to play. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Daniel, let me give the, you the final word. I, there, there was a woman that, in the documentary that, that sticks with me and she's waiting at the airport for the return of Alexei Navalny. And, and she said that she's come to see his return because he is a symbol of Russian freedom. And I wonder if, in the state of war that we're at at the moment, if that is actually true, that, that his freedom is now inextricably linked to, to theirs. You know, I think Navalny sees himself as part of a movement. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I think that he can't help but be emblematic of the future of Russia. Um, 
you know, it's tough to have hope, but Navalny preaches hope. He says we have to be optimistic. That's part of his brand. Um, he talks about the happy Russia of the future. Um, you know, it's the old adage that the night is darkest just before the dawn, and it is my hope that Navalny's story is is not going to end in prison. Um, that history is not yet going to remember him for having achieved his greatest achievements, and um, um, it's going to take a great deal of resilience for him to to get to the end of this road uh, to survive this prison sentence. But I know that if anyone can do it, it's him. Mm. It's a very good watch, the documentary. If you haven't see, seen it, uh, do go and find it. Uh, I can highly recommend it. Daniel Roja, Ari Toa, good to talk to you this evening. Thank you.